Hello, good morning. We are waiting for a couple of panelists and we are going to start shortly. Thank you. Actually, at the beginning, I wanted to mention that one hour 
Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us today. Do you, do you hear it fine? Okay. <clears throat> well, the purpose of this panel is to address trade negotiations and trade-related issues from a di different angle that, that's usually uh, took in uh, international negotiations. <coughs> so the title is Missed Link on Trade Negotiations, Multilingualism, and Multiculturalism in a Digital Era. Um, let me introduce our panel today, and then we are going to provide a, um, <coughs> an abstract and an introduction to this issue. To my right, I have Marilia Maciel. Uh, Marilia is a digital policy senior researcher at the Diplo Foundation. Previously, previously, she was a researcher and coordinator of the Center of Technology and Society of the Julio Vargas Foundation in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. She serves as a counselor at ICANN's generic name supporting organization representing the non-commercial stakeholder group. Thank you, Marci Marilia, for joining us. We have also with us Juan Carlos Lara. Juan Carlos is part of Derechos Digitales since 2008. Derechos Di Digitales is an independent Latin American non-profit organization founded in 2005 and whose main objective is development, defense, and promotion of human rights in the digital environment. Juan Carlos current, currently coordinates the research and public policy team of the organization. Previously, he worked as a researcher on topics related with intellectual property rights, freedom of expression, access to knowledge, and academic work in the digital environment. Thank you, Juan Carlos. And to my left, Carolina Guerre. Carolina holds a PhD in social sciences of the University of Buenos Aires, a master's a master degree in communication, culture, and society from the University of London, and a degree in social communication from the Catholic University of Uruguay. In addition, she is the academic coordinator of the Center of Technology and Society, an institution that aims to study in the fields of man management, regulation, development, and impact of analysis on new information and commu communications uh, technologies. She also is an affiliated researcher of the Social Science Department and the Technology and Society Center of the University of San Andres in Buenos Aires, Argentina. Thank you very much, Carol, for joining us today. So, as the digitalization of the economy advances firmly from and steadily from many fronts, where online services and products are shaking a wide range of traditional economic areas and sectors, it seems to also be questionable that increasing connection that exists between this phenomena and transnational trade. During this year, we have seen a lot of, uh, or many, uh, international um, um, negotiations going on on this subject. And recently, last week, uh, we had uh, the, the WTO ministerial meeting in Buenos Aires. Although the, <coughs> the, the results of that meeting were modest in terms of the outcomes that we have seen there, uh, it's unquestionable that the trade and e-commerce related issues are one of the most fundamental elements in the multilateral multi area, but it's not enough. We have seen also that perhaps the pace that the negotiations are how uh, international organizations are addressing r issues related with interna international trade and commerce is not enough. And those negotiations are, are going to be translated and transported to uh, regional and bilateral agreements. Examples of that coming from Latin America, for example, is the Pacific Alliance, where four countries of that region uh, are having a, an active agenda on digital trade uh, in a, in a, in an, and related issues. Also, Chile, uh, with the, probably the most uh, active country in Latin America in terms of international trade negotiations, signed two agreements this year, one with Uruguay and one uh, a second with Argentina. Mm -hmm. It's expected uh, to have the same kind of negotiations or the same kind of disciplines in treaties like uh, the, the negotiation of NAFTA uh, among the United States, Canada, and, and Mexico. And finally, but not last, um, we have probably, uh, we are going to face a negotiation between the Mercosur bloc um, and the European Union. So as you can see, this issue is going to be quite active in the agenda for the next month to come, and we need to address it from a different perspective. Um, as, we, as, we, as we have seen the, the, the evolution of international trade, there are common grounds of understanding on some elements of, uh, of 
these disciplines. For example, we find uh, electronic commerce chapters in many of the disagreements. We have provisions on um, IP rights <coughs> related with intermediary liability in some of them, telecommunication chapters and in most of them. But it seems quite clear also that there is different cultures and, and, and linguistic per, uh, <coughs> perspectives that should be included in those. For example, if we take, for example, the, the, the what happened during the negotiations of uh, these agreements um, related with intermediary liability rules, it's a clear example where, that, uh, where, uh, where a clash of different uh, jurisdictional cultures is, might be found. It's impossible or difficult to, to cut and paste uh, disciplines like notice and takedown or um, secondary liability in for many Latin American countries and elsewhere because those countries don't have those provisions internally in, um, um, in this own legal tradition. So the clutch on the, necessi the necessity to adapt you know, uh, international rules to local rules is important. <coughs> and we are going to organize this panel in one hour and we are going to have uh, two rounds of questions for uh, the panelists. And at the end of each round, we are going to open the mic for questions from the audience. And my, fir my first question for you is, considering the experience that we have seen in current and past trade negotiations like TPP, NAFTA, WTO, what are the main areas of negotiation that you have seen controversy between domestic law and trade and foreign rules? Marilia, I would like to start with you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Gonzalo, and uh, I like your, your proposition of dynamics for the session because what I have seen is that the trade sessions in the IGF, they have uh, managed to gather together a very experienced uh, crowd of people, so it's, it's a pleasure to, to hear the comments coming from the floor too. Um, I would like to come to the point of how the trade and the digital policy issues are sort of these two worlds are coming together, and then talk about a little bit of the controversies uh, that you mentioned. So we do have a few topics that are in the digital agenda for a long time that have traditionally been part of the trade agenda too. So if we think about uh, uh, privacy, consumer protection, authentication, this is part of the trade agenda since 98 in OECD, in the World Trade Organization as well. However, what changes right now, and I think that we can realize that we are undergoing a moment of change. If we look at the agenda of the IGF, the number of sessions related to trade, they have just proliferated in the last uh, um, two years, is that nowadays the trade, the, the issues that are being discussed on the trade, they have a much more clear connection with uh, topics of a much more technical nature than before. So in the WTO, for example, this year has been a very prolific year in terms of producing background papers on, on e-commerce. Several member states have started to put forward their views of what e-commerce negotiations could encompass. And this was all in the view of the negotiations uh, in the WTO ministerial that happened this month. So this was very useful because although we do not have a mandate to negotiate e-commerce, this could not be approved at the end of the WTO ministerial. We do understand a lot more the positions of the member countries and what they understand uh, could be part of a, of a trade agenda in the future. So there are several topics that are very known to this community here, but they were never really tabled so clearly in trade dis discussions, such as uh, data localization, encryption, access to the source code. So we are seeing that these two worlds, the digital and the trade, they are more and more converging. Um, to get to the second part of your question when it comes to the controversies that can be um, created there, um, Diplo together with other organizations, uh, CATS uh, International, the International Trade Center, UNCTAD, the Geneva Internet Platform, we have offered a course on e-commerce uh, this year, um, most in reaction to the demands from some of these trade negotiators that came to us and said we do understand a lot about trade, but we don't understand necessarily about, about digital. So could you offer a course so to get us up to speed in the view of the ministerial? And we did, we did prepare a course for them. And this course involved a lot of research on, on what are the digital issues that are being included, not only in the WTO, but also in regional trade agreements. Because one thing that is important to understand is that discussions in the WTO, they necessarily take time. 
We are trying to align the views of, of, of member countries all over the world. Um, so these negotiations will take time. And what is happening naturally is that a lot of these trade provisions that are not moving forward in the WTO are percolated into regional trade agreements. Um, so even though uh, the WTO does not have a mandate to discuss uh, e-commerce, it's not like we don't have provisions being adopted because they, are, they start to be part of regional trade agreements. So in preparation for the course, we went through many of these regional trade agreements uh, that are on the table when we try to understand what are the digital policy issues they, they, they are tackling. And one of them you mentioned before is intermediary liability. And this is something very interesting because many developing countries have started to regulate the internet with laws on intermediary liabilities because I think that this is one of the points that we were confronted very early coming from a civil law tradition. Our judiciary was asked to make decisions with regard to the responsibility of intermediaries. Uh, Orkut uh, in the old days of the internet, Facebook, Google. Um, and this is one of the topics that we have started to regulate very early. And we have somehow, at least uh, in Brazil, but I think in other countries in Latin America, departed a little bit from the model of notice and take down that is adopted in the United States, for instance, and we gave the judiciary uh, the oversight uh, to make a decision when content should be removed or not. So this is one of the issues that I think can cause potential conflict with the uh, national laws, uh, because there are many different uh, uh, ways of tackling intermediary liability. We have notice take down, we have notice counter notice and, and take down. We have countries that come to the judiciary and, and perhaps including these in trade agreements uh, makes, uh, tries to make these countries uh, 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 align them when actually there is no alignment on the way that we are tackling. And I, I actually think that this diversity is very positive because it uh, resonates with, uh, with the legal culture of each uh, country. Another topic that is being uh, included in regional trade agreements is the publication of the source code or provisions that say that countries should not mandate companies uh, to, to publish the source code of their products. And this is a long-standing discussion. In Brazil, for instance, our government does have uh, a history of uh, supporting open, open source software. So the public administration very early in Brazil adopted open source software as the software that should be used by all the public administration. So for us to have access to the source code has always been very important as a way of transparency, as a way of accountability. And as a country, we do see with good eyes uh, that companies provide uh, the access to their source code, especially when they are providing services to the government. However, that are there are other countries that see that this could create problems with relates to trade secrets uh, competition. So this is another issue that could create a conflict uh, with uh, national law. And of course, the way that countries are tackling um, issues such as data localization is, is very varied. We do have countries that have adopted laws on data localization, others that have presented themselves very much against that. So that could create a conflict. And the last one is that many, uh, um, 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 agree not many agreements, but that there are specific agreements that are tackling uh, domain name dispute resolution. And we know that this is uh, an area that we have a whole ecosystem that deals with a domain name policy, which is the, the ICANN. And we have a whole ecosystem of providers of domain name dispute resolution. So when you insert that into trade agreements, that could create confusion and potential conflict with a system that already um, exists. So there are other topics, but I think that these are perhaps the key ones that could um, create a conflict uh, looking from um, um, a first approach. Thank you. And that's super interesting because some of the, the, the agreements that I was, uh, Marila was mentioning and I was mentioning at the, at the beginning include these kind of topics. For example, Tilen Uruguay or the pro parallel protocol that the four countries of the Pacific Alliance uh, signing back in 2015, it's not effective uh, at, at this moment, but it's signed it, and uh, it was offered as, an, as, a, as a text for the countries that are uh, coming into the Pacific Alliance, like Australia, Singapore, mm -hmm. Canada, um, include this kind of provision. For example, not forced data localization, cross-border data flow. Uh, NAFTA nowadays is including two chapters, two different chapters uh, related with intermediary liability. One is electronic commerce, one is particu particular rules for um, 
um, IP, um, sorry, copyright content. So it's, it's quite interesting, you know, to, to observe, you know, that the, the areas that you were mentioned are already included in agreements that are uh, under ex execution, which is fine. I mean, and probably we will see that uh, usually, or, or obviously, in, in on the other multilateral uh, areas like you were mentioned, like WTO, although the, the, the results from the last week were quite modest, as I pointed out at the beginning. So let me follow with you, Juan, uh, Juan Pablo. What, what, the, what do you think? What, are, what is your approach on this? Uh, first, good morning, and thank you to Ally for the kind invitation to be part of this panel. Um, I want to go a bit back to the idea of multiculturalism, but a few steps back from what we just discussed regarding the issues that are being discussed or that have been discussed in either negotiating processes or, or the results of processes that have already finished. Uh, and to go a bit to the question about the areas of negotiation where domestic law and, and, the, and the international law or the trade agreements might be into conflict, the truth is that um, we need to see a bit back uh, regard, with regards to the countries that because of their developing state might not necessarily have those rules in the first place. And the truth is that when we speak about the trade agreements between developed nations and underdeveloped nations or developing nations, what we have is the absence of those internal rules and the trade agenda as the venue where those internal rules will be shaped. That is to say that the in rules for data protection, for intellectual property, or f and, and thus for the relation between a country and countries outside in the world, will not necessarily be shaped by, as we are used to say about the democratic process, uh, the product of uh, democratic discussion or democratic debate, but instead uh, the result of uh, trade agreements. Um, <laughs> A few things come out uh, of this. Uh, the first one is that trade agreements are mostly uh, proposed uh, to advance certain commerce agendas that are not necessarily the same as human rights agendas and that are mostly pushed forward by incumbent industries or those that want to uh, get better conditions for trade. They are, uh, as it's widely known, something that is highly valued by certain corporations. Uh, so trade agreements, in a sense, is basically the, uh, the result of global capitalism. And in that sense, when we see that developing nations have no rules on data protection, but now they have to shape them to, uh, uh, to be uh, consistent with these trade agreements, that uh, generates some results. And uh, I want to stop a, a bit on the controversial subjects because those reflect that kind of difference before we move maybe a bit later into the panel into other issues about uh, multiculturalism in a deeper sense. For instance, when we discussed issues of IP uh, re uh, resolved in many trade agreements in Latin America, which is the region that I come from, um, those IP ideas were not necessarily rooted in the needs of each country. In many cases, they were mostly part of the negotiation. And it's not just about intermediary liability and how much uh, it it's relevant for certain countries that they have certain rules in a certain sense for the takedown of content or the conditions for an intermediary not to be liable for third party content. It also goes to issues like the length of, a terms of the terms of protection for copyright. How long does a copyright uh, promote a statutory monopoly for its exploitation uh, even after the death of an author? Or, or how long does it keep to be does it get to stay in the hands of a certain company, a, a certain stakeholder, which is mostly relevant for those companies that exploit those rights rather than for the creation of new uh, works uh, and for, the, for how they promote uh, cultural growth. In, this, in the, the areas of source code uh, publication or the bans on source code publication, this is relevant for the creation of local industries and how they might impact or be part of the global trade, especially when we consider that uh, developing countries are constantly in need of, uh, of software and technological tools, but not necessarily are uh, uh, capable in an economic sense to finance their, their own need for those tools. So um, to summarize a bit my point, um, trade agreements are the way that the rules of global commerce are set the key concept here is harmonization. 
uh, to achieve a common set of concepts, of norms, of practices, and to iron out differences. And the problem with this is that the agreements are uh, not necessarily agreements between equal parties. It, it's still, trade agreements is still a very much a colonized space where uh, the overpowering might of global capitalism is able to set its own rules. And the advancements of trade agendas are, that are more convenient to those existing powers rather than the advancement of the rights of minorities or the rights of certain uh, developing groups. And it's a top-down uniformity that does not require the participation of, of the communities or the people affected by these treaties. So it's basically the application of the same regime to a majority without taking into account the minorities, their needs, uh, and only to create an apparent leveling field for global commerce. That's a problem that uh, can be addressed, but it's, it's a problem that only has these issues of e-commerce, of intellectual property, of source code, of net neutrality, as only manifestations of a much larger problem about participation in, the set, in setting the rules for global commerce. Thank you. Well, one of the beauties of the IGF is that we can disagree on issues, and <laughs> obviously we are going to have a discussion on that. Uh, but what you were pointed out at the end is going to be a part of the second part of this panel, which is how we make sure that we all are engaged in this kind of uh, negotiations and what's going on on international trade. So having said that, I would like to pass the mic to, to uh, Caro. Thank you, and <coughs> thank you all for being here. Um, my colleagues have uh, mentioned many of the issues I wanted to raise, and so I had to redo my notes, <laughs> but <laughs> that's great. Um, um, I would like to, uh, sharing uh, their concerns, um, to think about um, some of the issues that uh, particularly developing countries um, are facing in, in this uh, current uh, scenario. Um, and, and, and this is this idea that um, trade agreements are being, uh, who are the, the movers, uh, who are the countries or who are the stakeholders, the actors that are being able now to promote or, or, or work uh, uh, with impact in, in this um, international uh, trade scenarios. And, and those are mainly uh, the, the first movers. First movers that could be conceptualized both as, both as countries, but also as uh, companies who have the, the ability and the capacity to, to follow this, uh, these processes. So this is related with the question Gonzalo posed about controversies because uh, this necessarily uh, has a, a derivation consequences on uh, the kind of venues that many uh, developing countries and developing regions are um, questioning in terms of who should have uh, the mandate or who should have the, 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 the right to be imposing in, in which uh, current institutional uh, scenario the, the discussions uh, to go forward. So um, I think that this issue of, of the controversy and the fact that last week at, at the w, WTO, the, the mandate about e-commerce was not uh, uh, finally addressed uh, and, and resolved, which is an, an ongoing issue, is just showing how uh, uh, there are different coalitions and different uh, scenarios and perceptions of how, uh, who is uh, the, the right venue at the moment and whether the different countries are aligned in terms of uh, going forward and selecting the, the right institutional venue and the right process there. So I, I co to complement what my colleagues have already mentioned, I, I wanted to, to uh, address this. And, and finally, the, the issue of controversies uh, around uh, um, I think that it has been already very well addressed um, which are the main controversial issues. And I would also like to raise that there is a controversy about the implementation of these uh, issues. For example, so TRIPS has been already uh, imposed and, and agreed by in, in countries. But it's the problem of how to implement TRIPS. It's the problem of how to implement GDPR uh, in Europe, but also in other countries who might implement G G GDPR later on. That. Uh, this might not seem as if it's a controversy of a trade agreement per se, but it actually <coughs> is and will have an impact on whether it is included finally in, in the text. Thank you. Thank you, Gar. Well, that, that's interesting because obviously part of the controversy in terms of data protection, for example, is if 
we need to have disciplines or um, uh, clauses on, on data protection and on trade agreements, or we should have or take that discussion on a separate venue, for example. You know, it's a, that's a, what, that's one one interesting. The other one is like from the point of view of platforms or the companies that are involved, you know, on, on the development of internet, uh, obviously to have clear rules and to have set a set of clear rules on trade agreements is useful because it provides a, a predictable framework in order to know exactly what to do or what to not to do and how to address some of the most relevant issues related with internet. Again, intermediate liability is one clear example of that because it, 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 it sets a clear rules and mandates ab about what is the understanding of that? And in the case of Latin America, many countries negotiated rules that are not equal of, of DMCA or some of the elements that you might find elsewhere on other countries. By the contrary, it was a creation and, uh, uh, that took a very important uh, the uh, local jurisdiction and how to implement it. That that's why, because we don't have notice and take down in Latin America on some of the, the, the examples that Marila was mentioned at the beginning. Marco Civil of Brazil, Chile in, uh, in, in terms of copyright, uh, but also in other uh, ne uh, trade agreements that US negotiated with Colombia, Costa Rica, and other countries in the region. So that's one element that I would like to keep you to consider. So having said that, we have finalized the first round of interventions and I would like to open the mic for questions if you have. Thank you. Cool. Thank you, Adela Goberna from Asociación Latinoamericana de Internet. I actually work with Gonzalo, so. <laughs> um, so, Caro, I find very interesting what you were saying. So I would mostly like to know your opinion about cross-border data flows and how you see this combined with GDPR and revolving on the issue that Gonzalo was saying about the Mercosur and European Union uh, negotiations going on right now. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so um, th this, th the issue of uh, cross-border data flows in, in, in light of, uh, of, of the GDPR, which is um, sort of putting, the, striking a, a different balance, uh, and, and particularly it's sort of a, an orientation for, for Latin, the Latin American region where uh, it is looking and trying, in trying to define this, uh, the rules that will shape uh, the, the, the issue of, of data protection in the region is, is very much also related with, with a cultural issue which this panel attempts to address because on the one hand it touches upon uh, how we conceptualize privacy in Latin America which is definitely not the same uh, conceptualization that U Europeans have. And I would say that Europeans are also like, we're using a big label to describe many different scenarios, but okay, e e uh, Europeans have this uh, tradition and this idea of working together in, th in this sense. So uh, data localization and cross-border data flows touches upon, uh, okay, measures of dat data localization and how privacy is also uh, perceived uh, and, and, and how are we going to, again, going back to the issue of implementation, the implementation of a GDPR in Europe, ev even if GDPR becomes the, the standard in, in Latin America or in certain regional blocks of Latin America, it won't be able to be implemented in the same way as in Europe because culturally we are very different, our institutions work differently, we have a different con uh, constitutional and legal background and, and we have different operating principles already, so uh, this will, will certainly be uh, something to, to take into account. Even if we decide on the rule, then it's how we implement the rule, the, the big issue that, that uh, uh, particularly in Latin America, but also in other regions that might import uh, other uh, regional rules might, might have to face as a severe challenge. Thank you. Well, I think that the discussion on uh, data flows is very interesting because on the one hand, it is true that in today's economy, the role of data flows underpins many of the economic growth that we will see in the future, not only because a lot of the things that were commercialized and as goods have been dematerialized, but also because the commerce of services is increasingly cross borders. And there are aspects in which 
business, the life of businesses and the life of citizens will be much easier if we can find a way that underpins and, and allows cross-border cross border data flows to happen uh, in alignment with uh, standards such as privacy protection. But I think that the way that the discussion on data flows and data localization has been framed um, is particularly unfair because we have made this discussion a discussion about developing countries that want to localize data, um, most of all, as people say, for protect protectionist reasons. Uh, but when we look at the world, we see that data localization is a phenomenon that happens all over the place, including in developed countries, not only in developing countries. So the European Commission, for instance, has created uh, policies and guidelines to sort of try to curb data flow in the European Union because there are several countries that still localize data. One of the reasons is privacy, and, and uh, one of the justifications for the GDPR to happen is that privacy be before was regulated through a directive. So countries could implement a directive in different ways, and they did implement in different ways, creating a patchwork of different uh, uh, ways of implementation that created an environment that was very difficult for businesses to operate. So data localization for the protection of privacy uh, is something that the GDPR is trying to curb in Europe. But not only that, there are countries that uh, have data localization provisions for tax uh, uh, purposes, uh, for law enforcement purposes. Um, so it's not a, a developed versus developing country uh, debate. And there are also data localizations and data localizations. Not all data localizations happen for protectionist reasons. Um, and we should not uh, approach uh, the topic from, from these lenses, but have a more uh, balanced understanding that some data localization in some <coughs> cases can actually be uh, a good thing. We just need to narrow <coughs> down the cases so we don't undermine um, businesses and, and innovation. Um, um, but what is interesting, in my opinion, is that uh, many uh, of these regional trade agreements, they are not yet tackling data localization. Mm -hmm. So although data localization raises a lot of attention in, in forums such as, such as this one, um, there is a large portion of, of uh, reg regional trade agreements that are not uh, about issues such, such as uh, this one. So of course this is a topic that we need to discuss in order to, to move forward in a constructive uh, manner, but I think it, it is still in the debate a little bit. Yeah, of course, Carlos. Uh, th this is a, a great point, Marilia, uh, and, and it's also, I mean, talking about data localization and thinking that it just happens in certain countries, and, and there's a, another <laughs> phenomenon that uh, trade agreements also look carefully at, and it's uh, internet blocking, I mean, and, and in, as if internet blocking is only about, I mean, we tend to think, particularly in an IGF environment, uh, about uh, uh, freedom of expression, censorship, etc. but internet blocking is also a way of uh, um, controlling or, or disturbing uh, the data flows and, and a unified internet, and so this is again a provision that is uh, contained in many uh, of the of the principles or recommendations to go forward in, in trade agreements that that we might uh, sort of think <coughs> of it as uh, as something. Um, that doesn't correspond particularly to commercial practices, and it's big economies, it's large countries with uh, important markets that are following some of, of these uh, digital protectionism practices. No? Thank you, Carla. Juan Carlos? Yes. Um, uh, with, with regards to the idea of, of the implementation, um, I really want to pick up that idea highlighted by, by Carolina. Um, it has proven to be one of the cases where um, free trade agreements have shown their limitations too. Um, and also one way by which certain partners in a negotiation or certain partners in an agreement might also want to influence uh, the internal processes much further than the content of the trade agreements themselves. Um, one example is key in that. Um, my country, Chile, has a free trade agreement with the United States since about 13 years now. Um, in that agreement, uh, there were some intermediary liability provisions, and those provisions were implemented in a way uh, that was later also followed by other uh, norms like Marco Civil in terms of uh, infringing content, copyright infringing content that is posted online by a third party. The intermediary, the intermediary is not liable for that content in that content's infringing condition if the, um, if the intermediary takes it down 
under a court order. It's forced to take it down uh, when the court says so. That is not the same scheme that the DMCA has in the US. And it, it's compliant with the free trade agreement as the, uh, as the Chilean government might say, but as the USTR, the United States Trade Representative has said time after time since at least 2011 in their special 301 report, <coughs> Uh, Chilean law does not quite well implement the free trade agreement in that regard. They would like, in that sense, to have further, further influence in the implementation of that. And the certification process of TPP, the process under which uh, the U.S. government allowed itself to uh, not put a free trade agreement into compliance if, the, if they do not uh, certify that the other parties have complied with it first by implementation, is also a way of uh, trying to influence those internal processes. Uh, as for the implementation of other kinds of rules, it's very relevant, as Marilia highlighted, that um, the processes might differ from co one country to another, and GDPR is, is, in that sense, a standard that many countries in Latin America would probably want to aspire to, but there are limitations to its implementations in, in the sense that um, adhering to a treaty, either free trade agreements or treaties like Convention 108 or other conventions like the Budapest Convention in, in the case of cybercrime do not necessarily entice the implementation or the enactment of a protection framework, but rather the, the idea that those protections exist in form, uh, formally, that the, the fact that a country signs into those protection agreements might mean that the protection uh, exists the truth is that uh, in the implementation stage, it's much more different for countries and for developing countries to have the infrastructure or the cultural norms that serve into uh, a material protection of rights that uh, becomes fact uh, or a structure of judicial enforcement or administrative enforcement that would allow those rights to be uh, as valued as we think they are by the fact that countries sign uh, into law or sign into agreements uh, at the international level. Thank you. A couple of quick reactions of what you are, you, the panel is saying. In terms of um, how you can implement uh, provisions coming from the GDPR in different regions. For example, Mexico did a great job in taking perhaps the most relevant part of the GDPR mixed with some rules that you might find in other areas like United States or in, in countries in Latin America or Singapore and created their own framework in order to uh, be, <coughs> uh, be, be okay with the, the local regulation and the local standards that the Mexican authorities are thinking that are the most relevant and the most important to force their innovation on the one hand and also protect the, the users on, on the other one. So that's one example of how you, we can assimilate different kind of rules and not to cut and paste standards that are uh, evolving uh, as we speak. On data flow, uh, it's, it's super important what you were saying, Marilia, and let me add also that perhaps one thing that we forget here is that data flow is not, uh, when, when, we, when we regulate, or some countries try to regulate these issues, usually they think in big players in, uh, at the moment of, of the regulation. But uh, data flow is also very important for startups and medium-sized and small companies. Using this kind of data in order to, to, to move data across the region or across regions in order to foster the, the, their businesses and also is the pillar of um, cloud services that are, are being provided in, the, uh, in several regions that are lowering the, the, the barrier entries uh, to, to create business online. So that's one element that I, I would like to, to, to stress here. Um, we, we have limited time, so, but I have, I saw two questions coming from the floor, so three. Let me start with the lady over there. Uh, thank you. I'm sorry I came late because I was speaking on another IGF panel about the proposed e-commerce rules and trade agreements. Um, for uh, the issue that um, Juan Carlos raised about certification and imp 
flexibility and implementation is exactly true because the U.S. does this with all their free trade agreements. So in the Peru-U.S. free trade agreement, the U.S. government wrote the entire implementing laws for Peru and forced them to pass it through their Congress with no changes. Otherwise, they would not say that they had complied with the FTA and would not let it come into force. And in terms of uh, the Mercosur EU FTA and data protection, um, I, we don't, the EU did not release their proposals to Mercosur on this, but they did release their proposal to Mexico, and not just to look at the cross-border data flows provisions, but also the e-signatures one, because in the EU proposal to Mexico, um, it requires the governments to leave it entirely to companies how secure their websites are, for example. So if online banks choose not to use HTTPS and all your credit card details are stolen, that's fine. You have to leave it up to the companies. And you cannot require online shopping like Amazon.com to use HTTPS either. And this is obviously against the laws in a number of countries which require certain transactions to be a certain level of security. Um, so we don't know if the EU has proposed this to Mercosur because they haven't chosen to release that text and because it's a government to government, not multi-stakeholder negotiation, we don't know what's happening unless they choose to release the texts. The EU has made the same proposal in the WTO and its e-commerce proposals, but you get one category of transactions for an exception. So you pick, do you want online banking to be secure or do you want online shopping to be secure or buying air tickets online to be secure? Pick one. Everything else, they can steal your credit card details. Um, and then similarly in the cross-border data flows provisions, of course, at the WTO, Japan is proposing absolute cross-border data flows with no exceptions ever, including for privacy, and an absolute ban on data localization with no exceptions ever. And we heard from Rilia that there are times when you might want data to be stored locally, whether it's for tax, law enforcement, privacy, security, financial regulation, and so on. And even if the WTO privacy exception does apply to any new WTO rules on e-commerce, I don't know if you've already discussed, um, it's part of the general exceptions that are so difficult to use. Governments have tried to use them 44 times in the history of the WTO, succeeded once, asbestos, because you have to pass five different tests, and the privacy exception is even harder to use because it, in addition, has a self-cancelling sentence that says you can only use it for laws consistent with the WTO rules. So the European Data Protection Supervisor tweeted two days ago that data protection should not be subject to trade agreements because the kinds of um, exceptions you get in trade agreements are not enough, and the restrictions on data localization could water down the EU's data protection rules and open them to challenge and so on. So I've calculated there's about 13 different ministries affected by the proposed e-commerce rules, from privacy to financial regulation, tax, competition, health, car safety, environment, and so on. Uh, so it's not just about e-commerce and the internet, it has kind of collateral damage <laughs> into many other areas of regulation. Thank you. Um, any reaction from the panel to uh, thank you for the um, for the very concrete examples of this. Uh, this is very this is extremely useful in the sense that uh, this is not something that we can just agree in terms of like very broad exceptions or very broad terms. This has concrete consequences. And the thing is that uh, on the case of data flows and the case of protection and this debate whether flow or localization or or protection or or liberal uh, flow of of information is that. Um, this requires from us to be um, cognizant and, and to recognize uh, what lies underneath these regulations and try to understand the consequences much better. And it's not about a barrier to commerce necessarily when we, s when we speak about uh, personal rights and individual rights or even collective rights if we want to talk more about cult multiculturalism. Uh, when we speak about the protection of certain rights um, and how it might impact trade. It is not, uh, I mean, it's not forced data localization if we want to have reasonable standards that are achievable for the protection of personal data uh, before that data is exported because uh, uh, we understand that the protection might not be the same in a, in a different country. Uh, it's not forced localization if, if we think about that, uh, but instead it, the framing is different. If we frame all issues within the idea of trade or how it, what it means for global trade, we are definitely leaving behind several other considerations that might impact negatively, not only on, on certain legal rights, but in, on fundamental rights in the long term. Let me, <laughs> I disagree on some points, but we can, we, we can talk, no, because it's important to bring balance to, to this equation, but uh, obviously the, the, the we need to see all the aspects related with this thing and, and the cross-border data flow and the level of protection that some countries are, are allowing and the other countries are not. 
So I, I think it's a matter of balance and when we take, think and address this issue. Um, let, do you have a question? Thanks. Yes, thank you very much, Elena Mocevic. I would like to ask another question that might be a, a jump from this discussion here, but it's uh, relevant if you are discussing these issues in the digital era, which is basically, um, would any of the speakers would like to reflect on the trade agreements in the next digital era, which is the new technologies like blockchain, because this, uh, when you are talking about data flows, data protection, copyright issues in the current situation and in the blockchain possible era, they are completely different, especially when it comes to digitally created goods and the trade of these digitally created goods. So are there any movements on discussing the challenges and benefits of using new technologies or is there anything happening in this area? Thank you. Reactions from the panel? Well, I think that I haven't heard, I heard a lot with regards to blockchain and payments. So this is something that for developing, well, we just finished a course on e-commerce for developing countries and the issue of e-payments is uh, very relevant to them because there are regions in which banks do not provide services. So the use of mobile money is extremely important in some countries, uh, like, like Nigeria, for instance, I was uh, astonished to see the level of penetration of mobile money and they are because they, are, they do not have a financial and bank infrastructure in place, they are much more open to adopt new technologies than, let's say, the United States or, or Europe. They, they just completely leap, leapfrog some technologies, <coughs> and they are open to speak about uh, blockchain. So the use of centralized uh, currencies have been introduced, for instance, uh, in the African environment. So there is a currency that, it, that has been introduced on a sort of a pilot testing way by, if I'm not mistaken, is the Central African Union, but uh, I need to confirm this information, but it's already on the ground. So there are regions such as Africa that are already experimenting with uh, centralized currencies and they use uh, blockchain in the back. But another thing that I think is more present in the trade discussions is 3D printing, because when we talk about uh, cross-border trade and the dematerialization of goods, 3D scanning and 3D printing will take this dematerialization to the next level because you can scan an object, you can trade not the object itself, but sort of the design of the object that will be printed somewhere else. So just think about the impact that this could have when it comes not only to the control that, that uh, cross-border authorities have on what crosses the border, but also on the control of, uh, of taxation and costing revenue. So this is a thing that I wouldn't say has been like a hot topic so far, but I understand that there are several countries that are starting to think about in this world of 3D printing and dematerialized <laughs> um, commerce uh, 3.0 perhaps, uh, what, what is going to happen and where is the discussion on taxation and, and uh, costumes revenues going? Also, just to add that one of the biggest um, selling points of, of blockchain, especially for, for let's say, artists and, and cultural creators, is this kind of copyright, because on the blockchain, using blockchain, you can actually um, solve the problem of copyright. You can actually see who owns the copyright, and it cuts out the middleman of the registers and the panels of, of copyright. So um, you are you're absolutely right in terms of 3D printing of the goods that will be printed, but there is a whole industry of cultural goods that will only exist on the internet. Uh, and this is also uh, very heavily now in discussion of it being regulated and how, and especially of on uh, different kind of trades and replication and multiplication of this. So I would like to maybe uh, get. Okay. Yeah, very briefly, um, w when speaking about uh, either 3D printing or the use of blockchain and the elimination of certain intermediaries, um, I find that a fascinating subject in the sense of its governance and what it reflects in terms of the people that are participating in the, in the dissemination of cultural goods or, culture or products or just products in general when they might cross borders digitally uh, to be printed elsewhere. And, and I find that in the case of trade agreements and their relation to them, uh, in many cases uh, we might find that trade agreements might actually impede that those uh, developments might occur legally. It doesn't mean that they will not occur. Uh, innovation is much more faster and stronger than regulation often, uh, but it does mean that um, certain, uh, certain levels of entrepreneurship might be limited by what might be understood as the limiting factors of, of the implementing law that in fact enacts the international trade agreements. Um, that is a problem of the high level of detail that these trade agreements involve or their implementation involves when, when in need of certification. Um, but as we see it, trade agreements is an area where that should not necessarily be the case if we, what we are trying to do is promote trade. 
But one of the problems of the trade agenda is that it's not necessarily about the liberalization of trade, but the, uh, but the further establishment of already existing industries. So that is a, a problem, but it's a deep problem to tackle uh, within the next several decades. Um, it's, there's an issue about the, the timing and, and the space. So you have the entrepreneurs uh, working with 3D or blockchain technology, and then you have bureaucrats who, in what we see, is that they don't even are understanding themselves what blockchain is, and so they are still grappling, and we need to go to the level of the literacy of these uh, people who are then going to shape those trade agreements. Perhaps, let me frame it in a different way. I mean, trade agreements are frameworks uh, to facilitate commerce. And sometimes they include some technolog uh, technological measures, in, uh, like in, uh, internet, uh, intermediate liability, or cross-border data flow on specific uh, disciplines, because it's necessary in the way that trade is moving. But I think it could be risky at, at the same time in order to be so specific in order to uh, address one specific technology, which is in it's moving again as we speak because we obviously we can have the risk that get luck on, on, on that kind of discussions. But again, I, I would like to keep the idea that, it's that those are frameworks and, and, and moving. So is there any other question coming from the floor against Sarah over there? Uh, Raymond Sana from the Center for Socioeconomic Development. I just wanted to ask uh, the panelists whether you know of um, the trade facilitation agreement and what does it imply in terms of the digital side of it. You know, the um, countries who, who signed up for it also agreed to make the whole processing of uh, importing uh, goods or services more expedient and it's their requirements and a, a lot of that has uh, implies uh, digitalization. Now, in, in most of the developing countries, and particularly the least developed countries, they just don't have the software nor the know-how to do this. So they will be, in that sense, required, to, in order to fulfill the requirements, they will have to buy software and, and maybe, in that sense, also be dependent on the knowledge being still kept by the companies who will uh, put that in, in, in place. Uh, ha, do you know of any experience as to what, what the least developed countries <coughs> or the or developing countries have been able to do in order to get some form of knowledge transfer uh, or some participation that they can later on, once the, the whole thing has been installed, that they can be more uh, in control of the kind of software that they need to put in place in order to fulfill the requirements. Thank you, Raymond. I think your question is very good, first of all, because it uh, touches a point that I mentioned before, is that trade agreements are not only data localization, and the many issues that catch our attention here, usually in, in this uh, space, such as the IGF. So there's a lot of provisions uh, related to, to trade facilitation as well that are uh, very positive in principle if we think about the complexities uh, that, uh, that a small business company faces when it wants to export cross borders when it comes to understanding not only the national rules of the country that it wants to export to but also all the complications uh, they are still discussing at the WTO a single window which would be to create a single point uh, of entry now companies usually need to go and clear the procedures with different uh, authorities in, in the countries that they want to export to, which makes uh, the, the, the process extremely complicated. And as you mentioned, paperless uh, trade provisions are something that has been um, pretty much uh, discussed uh, in the WTO and is also um, present in a, in a large number of trade agreements. It's particularly a hot uh, topic in, in Asia, I would say, and I think that um, it, it, has, it has very interesting provisions, but it also has side effects as the ones that you have pointed out. 
because sometimes you, you are going to countries that do not have an infrastructure of an industry that would, uh, could be benefited from the fact that, uh, that uh, paperless trade is put in place to sell more, more national software, but there is no national industry to take advantage of that. So we are, again, um, um, talking about uh, um, benefiting companies that sometimes are located in, in developed countries. So I think that it takes us back, first of all, to the, to the discussion of open software that I touched upon very briefly in the beginning. I see with very good eyes when administrations turn to open software, like the Brazilian administration did some years ago. I understand that this is a decision that uh, is, uh, is uh, many times uh, subject to, to the political winds. So Brazil was a, is a much stronger advocate for, for uh, open source uh, code in the Lula government, in the Dilma government, and now not so much. Um, however, I think that there are good experiences out there, and this is something that uh, perhaps uh, developing countries could help each other. There are good uh, software that is open source with the advantage that it can be uh, uh, scrutinized. Um, many times when we buy software that is not open, we don't know what the software hides. Are there backdoors, for example? However, I think that it's also important to include uh, in trade discussions much more firmly the, the need to transfer of technology. This is, there is a barrier. There are some countries that do not want to see technology transfer included um, uh, as an issue, but I think that the, these two need to go hand in hand. We cannot talk about digitization and paperless trade if we don't talk about, on the other side, uh, um, um, help when it comes to technology transfer. So you touch a very, very important point, and I would point to the need of developing countries helping each other on that one, because Brazil and other countries have an industry of, of software, and perhaps this transfer of knowledge could come not only from developed countries, but among developing countries uh, as well. Thank you. Well, we are, we have 10 minutes to, to for, for the next question, but I, <coughs> coming from the private sector, I think that this dialogue is super rich, and that is what is, is more important about the idea of, I mean, being willing to talk and to understand the issues that you are mentioning is quite positive. So having said that, the, the last question or comment that I have for you and perhaps to the, re to the rest of the um, audience is like, last week in Buenos Aires, uh, Obviously, governments were dealing with trade and they reached some agreements. But uh, as I saw it, I and I'm old enough to remember that more, more or less was the same that the thing we saw um, 20 years ago uh, at the beginning of the WISIS process where countries were negotiating trades, uh, sorry, <coughs> rules on internet, but civil society was not there, private sector was starting to be there and other sector stakeholders were not having a voice. And that happened in Buenos Aires uh, last week, as we know. So what do you think is the role of the multi-stakeholder uh, approach uh, for the future of trade and negotiations, specifically or spe especially on, on a multilateral uh, uh, um, ecosystem? So, yep, Juan Carlos. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, I think in the terms of, of, of the framing of, of this panel and around the ideas of multiculturalism, the, la the least thing we could ask is a level of participation. Um, the, the WTO negotiation that you were uh, alluding to uh, was controversial because of its exclusion of certain actors. Uh, and it's not just about the participation of private actors, civil society, uh, along with governments, uh, along with trade groups, etc. Um, what all of this shows uh, in the trade negotiation space is that we often leave aside many interests and that, and that exclusion uh, then translate even into the digital space. Uh, as an anecdote, in one of the side room meetings uh, for the TPP negotiation, one inform information meeting at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Chile, uh, one person from a community came in to say, just to speak out about how she did not understand the contents of the negotiation because it was in English, uh, and she did not speak English. Most people in developing countries that are not English-speaking countries do not speak English, and they, and they are hardly aware of the consequences of these trade agreements. And it's not that they should be necessarily up to date in, with its development, but at the very least that there should be some level of consideration uh, for their participation. This involves, in many cases, the involvement of 
communities, endangered communities, indigenous communities, Aboriginal people, uh, people that live in extreme areas, uh, people that speak different languages in the countries that have different nations within their borders, because the, it, it's common that those do not have an influence even in internal policy. When that internal policy is even shaped differently or with other considerations in mind, those considerations are taken out. It's one thing to have the multi-stakeholder process or multi-stakeholderism ideas in the process, and I value that contribution into that conversation, and I do believe that that's necessary. However, participation is still very limited. Uh, while we might adopt some multi-stakeholderism, multi we still need to question how valuable it is to represent all the involved views and all the consequences that this may have. And the trade space is, the, is probably where we might have that conversation with the most possible effect. Trade negotiations can be positive in that sense, in promoting diversity, in promos promoting uh, culture and, and different cultures within each nation and each country. Uh, but that requires also to look very much deep into those. And that requires not only to have some people participate in WTO debates, but also that each country looks into itself and its own processes for uh, taking or uh, adopting certain positions when they go to negotiate trade agreements. Thank you. Uh, we have five minutes, but I don't know if you want to... Just very briefly. Okay. <coughs> I think one of the very concerning things that is happening, not only with trade, but in other fields such as cybersecurity, is that when governments talk about uh, private inv involvement, they are usually talking about PPPs. They are usually talking about reaching out to the private sector, because let's face it, when you talk about cybersecurity, there's no way that you can do it without reaching out to the private sector, because they control a large part of the infrastructures that countries want to protect in the first place. And I think that the in, in trade is, is, is about the same. When countries say, oh, we are not so close, we are reaching out to the private uh, actors. The private actors read the private sector. So there's a huge uh, gap between the communication that is taking place um, with civil society. And, and, and that is aggravated in the field of trade because trade has kept, was kept rank thin, fenced um, with regards to other interests for a long time. So e if you try to build an argument in the WTO based on environmental issues, it would hardly fly. If you try to build an argument based on human rights, that, that is not the argument that is going to fly. So even if we find our way through the door to get involved into the discussions, that will require part of our community to reshape the way that they place their arguments um, in a completely uh, different uh, manner. So that would be a challenge uh, um, um, for us. So in spite of the fact that I find extremely difficult to sort of roll back the inclusion of some of these topics on a, on a trade agenda, because they do have uh, trade implications, some of them um, need to be negotiated in some form, and then there's the huge discussion, what is, what is worse? Is it the WTO, which is an international organization, and uh, although you know, there's not transparency, at least as a multilateral setting, or uh, trade, trade arrangements in which the texts are kept secret uh, sometimes until the end of negotiation. So it's a very opaque, um, untransparent environment, one that we cannot participate because we don't know for sure what is taking place. Um, so the inclusion of a large number of, of topics, I think it's, it's, uh, it's concerning and that will require us to, to track them and to capacitate ourselves to discuss from standpoints in which perhaps we don't feel um, very comfortable with. Um, so that would require sort of a, a reskilling and a speciali specialization of some of us. We cannot do everything, and, and, and I see with very good eyes that this IGF is including uh, trade issues in the agenda and bringing some people that are originally coming from the trade community to the IGF, because together, sort of associating different knowledges, I think that it's the only way forward for us to have some say in these negotiations. Yes, just adding to that, uh, which I totally agree, it's um, <laughs> multi-stakeholder approaches in this process could really improve uh, the data gathering and the production of data that we need. I mean, coming from <coughs> uh, academia, then we are very concerned in kind of the, some of the <coughs> evidence based amongst uh, some of the claims that are made uh, for some provisions in terms of the impact for development, <coughs> et cetera. And, and we really are lacking some uh, strong data to back our, our assumptions. I mean, and I'm not just saying that civil society lacks data or governments lack data, but even sometimes companies lack the data. So 
I think that a multi-stakeholder approach um, to work along these lines and to be really much more honest in terms of what we are talking about. For example, when we want to measure cross-border data flows and Amazon says something and then another government says, uh, so I mean, there is, I mean, th there is, there are differences, but they're also because they are just looking at the side of the picture they can see and they need uh, a more global uh, engagement. And then the other th uh, avenue of opportunity for multi-stakeholder cooperation is to develop principles on on, on digital trade, I mean, which uh, which could become sort of a platform for uh, for the, the, the governments who are later going to negotiate in these specific multilateral settings uh, these uh, these environments. I mean, uh, th this uh, text. But um, th th these are my last two comments on, on the issue. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, we are running out of time to to take more questions. But let me thank you. Thank you, the panelists, and thank you for attending this. I mean, electronic commerce and, electro uh, and trade uh, is not the new flavor of the month. It's something that is happening now, ha affects many ways, and positive and some negative, but many ways, uh, the, the internet. So thank you very much again, again uh, and we look forward to receive your comments about this panel. Thank you. Thank you.